Hello, this is Mark from I Am Angie Organic and welcome to part three, Building Soil. Back to Eden versus Fall Leaves. Let's go inside and I have a demonstration set up for us. Step one in building soil. No plowing, no taking a shovel and turning over soil, no using even of a pitchfork, and no rototilling is necessary. Now where we left off from part two, our two by fours are our clay particles, and that's being separated by just a regular fungus that's in the soil. It's not mycorrhizal fungi yet, it's just a regular fungi that breaks down all the organic matter and helps it chew apart. That's the fungal food that we have on top of our soil here. Now that white string is the fungal hyphae that's coming down. Now when those clay particles are open now, now bacteria is going to come in. So let me put some bacteria down. Now what we have here is our bacteria that came down from the surface or also that was in the soil already. And that's starting to stick to the clay particles. But we need that bacteria to stay there because we want to start to have that bacteria eating some of the organic matter in the soil. So the way it sticks, it sticks itself to those clay particles using gum. Now we have the bacteria, and now we're going to have some gum. Push that down. Now the bacteria makes the gum, and then will stay in place so it doesn't wash away with the rain or move around in the soil too much. And now it's going to waste for some organic matter to come down. Now remember, the fungal hyphae, which is the white string you see there, also makes the smallest particles stick together. What that does, that releases a sap. Now for sap, I'm going to use some syrup. So now we're having the first particles being made, the aggregates, and these are micro aggregates. Now, what is amazing about this, this is the first process. Now, this is so important because it's going to build our soil properly. Humans cannot do this. Only nature can do this. And when we're looking at this, you have to kind of also imagine, too, uh, what I'm doing here is you're looking underneath a microscope right now at about 400 power magnification to see what, what I've been trying to create here. It's the smallest little thing going on in your soil to build soil. Now, we need some organic matter to come down. So when you think that you have to chop up things or let things decay, actually the bacteria and fungus will make it small enough to come down through those gaps. You cannot make it small enough to fit through those gaps yet. It actually has to be nature that does this to bring that organic matter down or liquid carbon through a plant root. Now, I'll just throw some organic matter in there. Now we have some small particles of leaves and wood chips that have filtered down and that's going to start feeding more of our soil um, food web which is our bacteria and fungi down there. Now we have a beginning of a micro aggregate or micro pores in between. That's the smallest amount that is in the soil. Now if we take that and just for example we take that and change what we're seeing here to just something that looks like that small sample of a rock that I was explained in the next demonstration how these small aggregates make a larger one. Now we have that one micro aggregate, which is the, uh, which is I'm explaining is a rock. It's not made into a rock, but it's being held together temporarily by the gums and the sap. Now, if we just look at that, turns to just one of these, and now we have all of these in the soil that have been stuck together into a larger amount of micro aggregates. And in between those microaggregates are micropores. Now, even now, it's difficult for a root to get down there. The fungus or the hyphae of the fungus can get down there and the bacteria can get down there. But again, there are micropores, very small spaces in between. So we need something larger to build bigger aggregates. And this is done amazingly by mycorrhizal fungi. Mycorrhizal fungi need something that the other fungi did not need. The mycorrhizal fungi needs a living root 
for it to grow in the soil. It needs to, that living root to be its host for it to grow inside and then come out from that root and make bigger aggregates in your soil. So if you see on the top, we have a piece of white plastic pipe, which is going to be our living root. Let's say it's our living root. Now the mycorrhizal fungi is going to, with spores that attack the root. Now these are good fungi. So this is something so important to that plant to have, to stay healthy, and to actually, it does so many things in the soil. It makes it healthy, the plant healthy. It makes aggregates, and I'll go into all the details. But the thing is, right now, is that I'm going to show you when it comes out from the white root, which is the plastic pipe on top, and into our uh, smaller particles there, it will start making aggregates. Now I have a piece of uh, clear hose, and that's going to be our mycorrhizal fungi, and that's going to push from that root in through the soil and move those particles apart. And now that will stay there. But now what has created, instead of having micropores, we have macropores, which is bigger. So now water can filtrate down below and start storing water inside your soil. It makes bigger aggregates now by just that fungal hyphae coming through and pushing all those smaller particles apart. Now, this is quite amazing. Now we're going to have to figure out some way of making it all stick together so we have stable soil or building soil. Now you can see that we have these beautiful micropores now. These are larger pores that again, like I said before, just allows everything to go into your soil. And it's creating in a, a pathways for everything to move around. And also what is important right now is what the mycorrhizal fungi does also, your two, your plant roots, which is the white root, which is the white pipe up on top, even that gives off CO2. And without these larger pores, the CO2 cannot be removed out of the soil. It has to get back out of the soil. If it can't, and this is a good thing that you should know for gardening, if it's stuck in your soil or compacted too much, or you just have micropores instead of macropores, which is our larger one, that CO2 stays in the ground and actually will cause your roots to decay or to rot. And here's another beautiful thing about nature. So the mycorrhizal fungi has created macropores, bigger pores in the soil so things can travel freely in the soil and give your plant stability and not be stressed. Now, it wants to hold those little smaller particles in place. So what it does, the mycorrhizal fungi has the ability of making glomalin. And what glomalin is, it comes from the root or the, the hyphae and it actually releases from the root and makes those smaller particles stable in your soil now, making bigger aggregates. So I'm going to demonstrate that with a little bit of shaving cream. Now, all those particles are going to stay together now into bigger aggregates. And now they're going to have a pathway in there. Now, also, too, what glomalin does is amazing, is on the root of the hyphae, it seals it. And now what it does, since it's sealed with this, let's say, shaving cream or glomalin on the outside, it allows the fungal hyphae to transport nutrients in the soil. It becomes like a highway for nutrients. So if a nutrient is something is like say uh, a couple inches away from the root, it can grab onto that and bring it through back in the tube or inside the fungal hyphae back to the plant root and feed it when it's necessary. Now again, beautiful nature is doing this for free. We don't have to do anything except not disturb the soil and uh, put some type of residue on top of the soil, whether it be wood chips, hay, uh, leaves, and just create, start creating that fungal hyphae to start growing. And also have, it's very important to also have a living root in the ground so that mycorrhizal fungi starts developing those bigger highways in the soil and making bigger aggregates. It's, 
It's one of the most important things in your soil. I also want to show you this graph here, or, or a table. Now, bacteria, this is in a cup of soil that's not disturbed. 200 billion bacteria, 200 million protozoa, 100,000 meters of fungi. Amazing. This is what nature is doing all the time. Please leave it alone. It's going to do just fine by itself. So now when you go out there and you dig the soil or rototill it or plow it or disturb it of any kind, you're going to do a problem like this. You just destroyed what nature created all that time over the winter and you've destroyed it all because you ruined all those soil aggregates and you disturbed the fungus hyphae that's in there too that actually you're cutting apart and is not going to start helping those plants anymore. We're looking at our trial field, which we have our fall leaves on the left and our wood chips on the right. And what I want to show in this series is the pros and cons about back to Eden versus fall leaves. Now, one of the cons or the disadvantages of both of them is that we do not see anything green in our field. We have nothing growing. Now, I understand it's winter time, and we're, we're coming out of winter, and things are dormant, but still things can be green, and I'll show you an example in a little bit here. Now, with something green, that means it's usually a living root. That living root is very important for us, because that living root has to be there so mycorrhizal fungi can grow. I took a step over to the left a little bit more, up on the hill here and what you can see is our fall leaves and our wood chips in the background but in front of us and this is what I want to point out here we have a living root and what this is called is called winter rye it's pretty much a staple cover crop that's been around for a long long time it's probably original cover crops that was out there but this living cover crop of winter rye also has a living root which is helping that my mycorrhizal fungi in the soil to stay alive and to help rebuild that soil which is very important it's one of the most important funguses in the soil and this is just a better close-up of it it's not a weed it's just it's just a pretty much a rye grass but not to be confused with annual rye grass now I just stuck a shovel in the ground. It went about a foot and a half deep, or about a foot for sure. And now what I want to show you here, and I'll get a close-up of it, is how those winter rye roots are working for us very well. Now, if I can see here. Now, on the very bottom, we have our roots that are down at least a foot or more. And in here, see this clump here, which is moving, these are soil, larger soil aggregates that I was talking about. This is where, on the roots, the roots made out, and you won't be able to see them, is that fungal hyphae, mycorrhizal fungal hyphae. Now, those fungal hyphae has made these clumps, these aggregates here, that I'm knocking off slowly. This is being held together. These aggregates are being held together by that glomalin. And also, we got two inches of rain yesterday, and you can see that it's not really being affected too much in the soil. It has filtered through that soil very well because everything is nice and open now and left alone. So how are we going to get a living root in the ground prior to planting our other crops that we used to use for our vegetables? So in the back to Eden method, or using wood chips or leaves, he does have a living root in the ground. It's trees. Now that tree is supporting that mycorrhizal fungi during the winter time or keeping the spores reproducing. Now we don't need to plant trees, which would be nice to have are fruit trees, you can, but we're gonna plant an annual tree, which is sunflowers or sunflower seeds we're gonna plant. So now if we know where our rows are going to be, where our annual plants are going to be set in, our tomato plants or anything of that similar nature, we can start planting sunflowers a month ahead of time. Now they'll start growing 
in between uh, the plants, which is our clay pots that we see here. And the sunflowers won't interrupt or harm or anything, but basically what we'll do, we'll start making those bigger soil aggregates ahead of time and allowing more mycorrhizal fungi to be available to those plants in the ground when you start transplanting your plants outside or starting your seeds. The type of sunflower seed you wish to purchase is a single stem, uh, single flower type, some are branch flowering, but you want a single flowering type. And also too, you don't want it to be pollenless, you want it to have pollen. Now there's other benefits of planting sunflowers in between, besides having the mycorrhizal fungi root down below the ground, uh, which I'll get a little bit later on and explain to you. The upper part is going to give your beneficial insects to come in, your birds, your bees. The birds will land on top of the sunflower and look around for insects in your garden. The bees will pollinate and also bring in to actually pollinate your other plants. Another great advantage or benefit of the sunflower, it's working taking those sun rays, photosynthesis, and pumping liquid carbon back in the ground, which is so important. Your wood chips and your leaves do add carbon to the soil, but not as much as liquid carbon can. That liquid carbon that's being pumped down in the roots and also the sugars that are coming out of the roots are also increasing the fungus and the bacteria in the soil. So it's all very good positive inputs. The sunflower root, which is so amazing in itself, can go up to five feet deep in soil. So even if you have compact soil and it goes half the distance, it's so beneficial. Now, that sunflower root will also start ahead of time that mycorrhizal fungi to begin your soil, start making those larger aggregates. I hope I explain this the right way. So in the same row that you're planting the uh, your vegetable crop, now you want to plant sunflowers in between each one. So say the, the clay pots are uh, squash plants and they're about three feet apart. In between in that same row, not between the rows that you walk in, but in that same row as the squash plants, you want to plant one or two sunflower seeds. And you want to plant them at least a month ahead of time. If you can plant them eight weeks ahead of time, great. The, my experience planting sunflower seeds, I grow usually about 5,000 sunflowers on my farm every year, is that I start planting them in uh, the beginning of March. And I know I get a lot of heavy frost after that, but they survive it quite well. I am also uh, have to do another film, I just wanted to get this done because we're supposed to get a couple of inches of rain in the next couple of days and it's very windy out but I, and I apologize for the wind on the camera if you can hear it. But also too, I will go over how to incorporate the uh, winter rye into the ground and also more sunflower seeds into bigger areas. So where we're going to be planting a say um, watermelon and cantaloupe. In part four, I'm going to explain a couple more uh, processes of getting some um, mycorrhizal fungi started in the ground prior to planting. But I have to order some seed up and I want, wish to do that. But within the next few weeks I will get the other video out. I want to thank you for watching. I know this has been a long video and I appreciate your patience, but there was a lot to cover in this video. I also wish to thank Red Baron Farms for uh, giving me a small education on the proper things that go on in the soil. And if you haven't subscribed already, please do. I always appreciate all those questions that you send me too. If I don't get back to you too quickly, I'm probably in the process of making another video. But enjoy your day and thank you very much and please give me a thumbs up. Oh, this is too funny. Her bird came in and landed on top of the sunflower. This is hysterical. Thanks.